Hi folks, it's Andy, the Expedition Hiker. Here we go on another hike. But this time we are walking a long distance path called the, the Portway. This is an ancient path from the Bronze Age that is 48 miles long. It will take us about four days. So on my back, I've got all my camping and backpacking gear. So the path starts at the Hemlock Stone in Nottinghamshire. Just over the border, we walk into Derbyshire and then all the way through Derbyshire, through the Peak District National Park. And then we finish off at Mantor, is one of the highest mountains in the Peak District in the Edel Valley. This ancient track has been a key trade route from the Bronze Age 4,000 years ago. So I'm ready and prepared for the journey ahead. So hopefully you'd like to join me on this adventure as we walk the ancient portway. We start at the Hemlock Stone in Nottinghamshire. Close to the Derbyshire border, this outcrop stone is made of two types of sandstone. At the base, we have red sandstone. At the top, we have Lenten sandstone, which is what Nottingham Castle sits on. It is estimated to be more than 200 million years old from the Triassic period. It stands at 28 feet or eight and a half meters high. Lenten sandstone is a soft light brown color where, as we can see, the hemlock stone is tarnished, where black in colour, this is due to the industrial pollution. It was used as a beacon for Queen Elizabeth II's Golden Jubilee in 2002, when they lit a fire at the top of the stone. And it is mentioned in D.H. Lawrence's semi-biographical Sons and Lovers as a little new twisted stump of rock, something like a decayed mushroom. In the past, Druid ceremonies have been held at the base of the stone, using it as an altar for thousands of years. The Derbyshire Portway is an ancient prehistoric trackway, which can be traced from the Hemlock Stone on the edge of Nottingham to Mantor in the north of Derbyshire. Why is it called the Portway, you may think? Well, the word Portway believes to go back to Anglo-Saxon times, as the word may mean main road, or it is a haven for weary travellers to pass through. Along the route are a variety of prehistoric and historical sites, including a hermitage, hill forts, carved crosses, churches, standing stones and ancient burial mounds. The track dates back to the Bronze Age and was regularly used until the end of the medieval period. The portway has been followed by travellers for thousands of years as a link between the Trent Valley, the Peak District and beyond. The route of 48 miles passes the hermitage, Dale Abbey, Beerstill Priory, Horsley Castle, Macney Hall, Elport Heights, Worksworth, Robin Hood Stride, disused mines, Stone Circles, Ashford in the Water, Monsell Head, Wardlow Myers, Giant's Hole, and finishing at Mantor, and many more places along the way. A lot of the route is now quiet lanes or footpaths. It is classed as a challenging hike and it meanders through some of the Derbyshire's most delightful scenery from the lush Durant Valley to the moors of the Peak District. Today's aim is to walk around 15 miles, which is 24 kilometers, just past Milford, where I can hopefully find somewhere to pitch my tent for the night. As the landscape has been developed over the centuries, our first couple of miles of the route means roads and houses have covered the ancient trackway. So I'll be happy when we pass them to get to open fields and nature. Away from the barrage of modern noise, the track passes through a mineral-rich landscape of diverse geological bedrock as we travel through the Peak District's National Park. Derbyshire's Peak District landscape has evolved through its history, through its natural form, its stones and crust, together with man, with its literature and industry.
absorption. The Nutbrook Trail is a flat trail that stretches 10 miles through the Amber Valley and is part of the National Cycle Network, which connects Hena with Long Eaton and the trail follows open land and the towpath of the Erewash Canal, passing canal locks and old brick mill buildings along its way. This is St Giles in San Diego. It's an 11th century church that is now Grade 1 listed and restored in the mid 1800s. The interior in 1883 had new pews and a grand organ installed with gas chandeliers. I guess the people were small back then. That door looks normal from here. But when I stand against it, you can see it's probably only about five feet tall. Sorry for the bad hair day today. I don't know what's going on with this bit here. It wasn't like that yesterday. We're just walking through the old part of San Diego, the old village, and then we're going to head up towards No Man Lane. This is the old lockup. Now the drunk seems to have far to go because the pub is only just across the road. Now the Bluebell, I believe, has been there more than a hundred years. When the portway path was actually started, it didn't have things like this back then, a motorway. Two miles into the portway and we're away from the hustle and bustle of city life. We're on a nice country lane and we've just crossed into Derbyshire. So basically we've got 46 miles of walking through Derbyshire until we get to Mantor in about four days time. This unique street is the only one named No Man's Lane in Great Britain. Its high point is 133 metres where we'll be able to see a trig point, triangulation pillar. Next place we're heading to is the Hermitage. So we've just entered the Hermitage, which is part of Dale Abbey. The Baker of Derby was led to Deppendale, the old word for Dale, around 1130, by a vision of the Virgin Mary. He is compared to Cornelius the Centurion, who gave elms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. Like Cornelius, the unnamed Baker spent his disposable income on food and clothes for the poor. He carved a dwelling for himself from the sandstone and built a timber lean-to on the front to shelter him and his animals. Hopefully you can see that there's a cross carved into the stone. Baker lived in the Hermitage for 20 years, after which he moved here after building this chapel, a place that he could actually live within. Now, this is believed to be the smallest chapel in England, where the actual room space is only 20 foot by 16. And over the years, or over the hundreds of years, or over the centuries, this building has been a pub, a hospital, and still is a private chapel today. Dale Abbey, also known as the Abbey of Stanley Park, was a religious house. The legend portrays it as developing from the Hermitage around the early 12th century. The Augustian canons moved to Dale Abbey in 1162 from their previous home at Kelk Abbey, where we visited recently on a video, the Melbourne Circular. The Abbey became established in 1199 although 
a relatively large abbey, it only had 24 canons. The abbey provided priests to the local area. After the dissolution of the monasteries, the abbey was torn down and all that remains is this 40 foot high chancel window. As we walk into the village of Dale Abbey, we can see some of the remnants of the abbey. This was the abbey gatehouse. Tittle cottage. Big thick wall attached to this house. And looking behind the building, just between the two buildings, we can just about see at the, on the ridge line of that building, part of the wall as well. The phrase tittle tattle is believed to derive from the tittle cottage. In years gone by, at the carpenters' arms, they used to have cockfighting. We're going to head up Arbor Hill now, then we're going to head towards Stanley, which is a bit close to me, because the village of Stanley is named after me, even though the village is 300 years old, and I'm not that old, but my surname is Stanley. And the church, it's funny enough, it's called St. Andrew of Stanley. So if we shorten it down, it's Andy Stanley. And that's the Expedition Ica, and that'd be me. Just crossed the A6096. Now, if anybody like to follow this route for yourself, then uh, obviously all the links uh, will be in the description with the route, and I will put uh, any information once I complete it that will help you. Now, one of the things that I would say is when crossing the A road that I've just crossed. Uh, I think you may need to book an appointment because it took me nearly five minutes across the road. Being a bit busy both ways. Anyway, we passed it. We're on. Uh, we're heading up to Lower Hag Farm now. Uh, another simple country lane, and then we'll get onto the footpath, and then hopefully we'll get onto quite a few more footpaths. Hopefully you're enjoying this walk so far, although we've only five miles into it. The next port of call is Stanley, which is about a mile away. But anyway, if you uh, like to subscribe and you haven't, and if you like hiking, backpacking, and long distance walking, and like to learn some tips and skills about the great outdoors, and also like to download some routes, because they're always in the description, every route I do, you can find the link in the description of how to follow it for yourself. Not sure what's going off on my hair today, but it's going to look a bit scuffier in four days time. So please consider subscribing. A like would be great. So next week's walk will be part two. So we've just reached Lower Hag Farm and we're going to head this way on the footpath now. And this hopefully should take us all the way into uh, Stanley. Tally ho! So just crossing the road, uh, just up there is the village of Stanley. If you want to know more about the village of Stanley, then uh, if you'd like to follow one of my other videos that I'll put a link to here, it's where I actually officially introduce myself. But anyway, but anyway we're walking, continuing this way and we're heading towards Morley next. We are now following three ways at the same time. So we're on the portway as we continue on that. We're also on the Midshire Way and the Centenary 
way. Both of which I've spoke about in previous videos. Interested drainage pipe system. It's a pity they haven't designed smelly vision yet because the, I'm just walking past the cattle farm and uh, the fresh air of a country smell. Ooh, not just clearing my nasals, it's actually pleasing and clearing my lungs, breathing it in. Oh, that's a lovely smell. It is the smell of the country. Well, all my years I've never seen a style like this. Slightly different, but it's more contemporary. So we just arrived in the village of Morley. The church is quite renowned as a local landmark, mainly because of its tall but steep spire. So we near here we have the Bredstall Priory. So it's got an association to this area that we're in right now of Morley, as we just saw the monument. And then here, it's quite an old building. It's like a small private chapel. The church is of St. Matthew's and there's got an association to St. Christopher, who is the patent tra saint of travel, which is appropriate as I walk the portway. Looking towards Morsley, and we can see the spire, which was used as a local landmark for the weary traveller who was travelling on the portway. As we continue on the path, uh, we just go past this place. It's, it's named as a mound. Uh, nobody really knows what it was built for, although there's two stories that they believe uh, could be possibility for it. So it's six and a half meters high. There is a possibility that there was a post mill on top of it, although there's no uh, remnants of that. Alternatively, it is a lookout tower for the Romans, as uh, what I'm standing on now is an old Roman road. And we're gonna follow that down for the next little while. Morsley Elm Houses. Is this Jacob's Ladder? The area that we're passing through at the moment is famous for its quarries. For one square mile of where I am at the moment, there are 10 quarries. Nine are disused 
and one is partly still being used at the moment, which we can see some of the stone in front of us. Now the stone they've been quarrying is sandstone and uh, buildings like Woolerton Hall and a lot of the churches in the surrounding area would have been built from this local sandstone. They believe that uh, Kedleston Hall in Derby is also built of the stone from this area. As I walk through this uh, overgrown area of bracken, ferns, then uh, we're trying to find Horsley Castle, the remains of Horsley Castle, which is around here somewhere, and one of the deep disused mines. I can't even see the base of this one. And this is in the centre of the woodland area. So I believe this to be the last remains of Horsley Castle. You can see some brickwork there and it is actually on the highest point of this area which generally castles are on the highest point so it's a 12th century fortification manor house that expanded to have a keep and castle walls it's standing in a prime position overlooking the Derwent valley although the woodlands now blocks that view the site was part of the barony de Buren from 1086 to 1514 then given to the Duke of Norfolk by King Henry VIII. And in 1568, the title of Earl of Chesterfield was gained with the castle. So continuing on the Portway path, we are next heading towards Coxbench. And noticing while I'm going through this quarry area, all these ants bought loads of them in different places. Probably every, and what these are going all the way down the road. Are they, are they the portway ants? So we're doing quite well so far. We've uh, walked about 11 miles of the route. So we've only deviated off the actual portway path once, and that's only due to development of farm that's been built on the path. So all I did was walk around the building. So I was at less than 50 meters away from the path even then. So, so far, so good. It's also fairly quiet. Uh, although airports on a few roads, I haven't seen much cars, and it is a Friday. I've only seen probably a dozen cars along the way on the trails and a couple of major roads. I'm going to do that so soon as well. And also, I've uh, probably passed only about six or seven walkers. So just in front is the A38. This is a road that starts in Mansfield in Nottinghamshire and finishes in Bodmin in Cornwall. It is 292 miles long. This is the old station at Coxbench. Now, as you can see, this uh, track here would have been a railway track, obviously disused now. It was built in, let me put that on the screen because I can't remember. But we're all gonna, just going to walk up past Cox Bench Hall and end up towards Holbrook, the old station house at Cox Bench. So this is Cox Bench Hall, or that is although it's behind the trees and the wall so they can't see it very clearly but it was built in the late 1800s and now is a residential home for the elderly so we're just walking up the hill into Holbrook and coming across this nice chapel with a clock so just in the centre of the picture now, in the, on the horizon, we can see Elport Heights uh, with its mass, and uh, I will be there tomorrow. At the moment, we're heading towards a Mackney, Mackney Hall. Got uh, cows protecting the little calf.
the Hollybush Inn in Macme. It is a Grade 2 listed building as it was built in the late 17th century and is one of the oldest pubs in the area. Well, I was expecting a better view than this, but this is Mackney Hall in Mackney. And uh, I will put a, a picture up of what it looks like from the front. It's a little bit grander, Victorian building. Mackney Hall was built in the late 1800s for Mr. Strutt to show his fortune of the mills he owns around the area. It's built in a grand Victorian style. In 1936, Derbyshire Council purchased the property and it was then opened for ladies out of wedlock to have their babies. The NHS started in July 1949 and took over Mackney Hall as a mental handicapped hospital for women. It closed in 1988. In 1991, the hall became a hotel as it is today, a place of fine dining. I've sampled their delights in the past. This is our first look at the Duwent River and we are at Milford. Originally it was of Jeradiah Strutt who lived here, uh, now it is Milford uh, Key Home. So we're just heading out of Milford, as you can see on the left it says we're going up Sunny Hill. Now this is a very steep hill, it may only look like a slope on the camera, funny enough a long time ago, 15 years ago, I used to date a girl that used to live up this road. Uh, she used to live in a cluster cottage, which is a mill worker's cottage. And the mill worker's cottages, they had, the, they were like terrace houses, uh, houses either side, but they also had houses at the back. They were attached part of the building. So the windows at the front of the building were their only windows in the cottage. At the back was just one big, big brick wall, and uh, the other side of the wall was somebody else's cottage. Well, I'm puffing and panting climbing this hill. Maybe looking downwards might make it look a bit steeper than obviously when looking up. But on the other hand, as you can see just there, there's a guy on crutches, old man on crutches, making it up the hill. So I'll best get finishing it myself. If he can do it, I can do it. We've just reached the top of Chevin Hill. Now underneath me is a railway line that goes directly underneath this tower. This tower is actually built for, in reference to the railway line, although not sure why. It's never been finished. It ha either had a rotating telescope in it that would work out the line of uh, this, the train line that's dug underneath, uh, that it was, matched up with each other from either side of the digging or it was to look down to the tunnel and see the passing trains now behind me is a air shaft so from the tunnel obviously back in the steam uh, days and out else there would have been a lot of pollution so this would have been a steam shaft or a air shaft from the tunnel which would allow air, cleaner air, in and out, and obviously the polluted air blown out into the environment rather than being just stuck in the tunnel. Now we're heading over the Chevin Golf Course, uh, and uh, we've got, still got a bit of climbing to do. I think we're about 150 meters above sea level, 
Uh, we've got about 40 more uh, before we start going back down again. So we're still on the portway. Uh, it's still it's leveling out a bit now, so that makes it easier. It was a bit of a hard climb. Uh, I'm glad I'm on at the top. I'm running out on uh, water at the moment, which is a problem, as I'm going to be staying. I'm aiming to sleep somewhere in the next three or four miles. It's about 5:30 at the moment, so uh, I don't want to set up camp till about eight. So. We've got about two and a half hours more walking. I could probably get another seven or eight miles in there if I'm lucky. But we're at about the 14 mile stage and uh, we'll keep going. I'm just walking up towards the summit of the hill and I've just come across this wall. Fortunately there was a guy that's uh, obviously local who knew what it was for. Because it's just a, a wall standing in the middle of nowhere. It was a practice rifle range for the First World War. So if you're looking at it a bit closer, you may be able to see where some of the uh, rounds have hit, like uh, the bullet holes. Especially around here, that's like looks like a, maybe a doorway to the base. So just looking along the valley, this is the Ambergate Valley, and then this is Belper in front of us. On the horizon is Ripley. And looking across this way, the red building is the Jedediah Strutz uh, North Mill of Belper, which is being claimed as the first fireproof building in the world. Then looking across there, we can see Heege and then uh, Ambergate. Uh, not be able to see it at the moment, but uh, soon we'll be able to see Kreich, Kreich, Kreich Memorial Tower. Anyway, we're heading along the portway, we're going downhill now. Uh, we're heading towards, well, heading towards the main road, uh, which is about a mile away. And then we're going to walk up to I believe it's called Black Black Rocks. Black Black something. I'll tell you in a bit. So far I've been pleasantly surprised. When I was planning, well, when I was looking at this route on the maps, it did look like uh, a lot of road development have happened along the ancient portway. Uh, but I've been fortunate. It's uh, so far I've walked what 16 miles. Uh, it has been a mix. There's a lot of walk, uh, footpaths and everything else. There is a few roads I've walked along, but the good thing is that uh, they've all been quiet. I've already walked the English pilgrimage last year, which is the uh, pilgrimage from Winchester Cathedral to Canterbury Cathedral. That hopefully that should be coming out on in a video in the next next few months. It was basically filmed before I had a channel, but with the purpose to use for the channel. So, wait for that to come out soon. He thinks I can't see him, but well, I can. Pheasant there. So just looking over the Derbyshire Dales. So question of the day, how is this latch going to reach that? Because it doesn't, it's not even half the length. Answers on a postcard, we'll leave them in the comments.
So the good news, I've found a water source so I can fill up my water bottles. The bad news is my camera battery is just about to run out. So until I get to the campsite, oh, well, my campsite, until I find a place to camp and charge up my phone, this will be about it for today. Now hopefully I've got about a mile to go until I can find a nice pitch for the night. Okay, so we're at the end of the walk for today. So hopefully you've enjoyed it. And uh, if you'd like to follow me on part two, which will be coming out soon. So until next time, take care, have a good one and bye bye hikers. Bye.